welcome back to another session of physical sciences, chemistry again. And in today's session, we will look at acids and bases. The last time we spoke about the autoionization, we spoke about KW, KA, and KB values. We looked at the pH scale, we looked at pH calculations, and we also looked at the application of Le Chatelier's principle to our acid and base reactions. In today's session, I would like to look at titrations. The terminology that will come up a lot is neutralization, titration, endpoint, equivalence point, and indicator. So neutralization is a reaction between an acid and a base, and when that acid and base reacts to form salt and water, we say they neutralize each other. Remember, we don't say they cancel each other. The one neutralizes the property of the other. When we look at titration, titration is the technique used to determine that neutralization point of an acid-base reaction. So if we have that neutralization reaction, we can actually make use of an experimental method that's called a titration to determine that endpoint, meaning that point where the acid and the base has now neutralized each other to a certain extent. So that experimental method is used to determine the unknown concentration of either the acid or the base. For us to do a titration or to do neutralization, how will we know what's the end point? How will we know this is now the product? So for acid-base reactions, we use chemicals to show us that there is now a neutralization. So that chemicals are used, that we use are called indicators. And an indicator is a chemical that changes a color, its color, depending on the pH of the solution. And when we have that change in color, we will then know if it's from the one color over to another color, we know that some reaction has taken place, and we might even, according to the color, know if that was the end point or not. So if we look at an acid-base reaction, I said that an acid and a base forms a salt and water. So if we want to evaporate the water, we will all be left over with the salt, and that salt will all depend on the acid and the base that, we re that reacted. So in a titration, we observe the color change when that acid and that base neutralize each other. Okay, we can only see the color change if we have the correct indicators. Now we will talk about correct indicators um, soon, but for now, you just need to know, for every reaction that you have, you must choose the correct indicator, else you will not really know if the end point is the correct point. So this, where that indicator will now have a color change, there, at that point we know it is the end point of our titration. End point doesn't mean it's now the end of everything, it means it's the neutralization point of the acid and the base. And that color change will then be able to help us or give us more or less a rough idea of the pH of the salt that is formed. When we have the endpoint of a titration, that endpoint means that all the reactants have changed to products. So at that end point, there's no reversible reaction. It basically means that A plus B has now formed C plus D, and that one of your A or B is used up. That's the only way that we know we now have an end point. So this is also known when, both, when all the reactants are used up. That end point is called the equivalence point. So the end point 
is the point of the titration where the reactants uh, and the where the reactants have neutralized each other, it will be shown to us by means of a color change, and the equivalence point is when all that reactants are used up and changed into products. So neutralization occurs when a strong acid reacts with a strong base. Now neutralization, I said, we have an acid and a base, and the acid and the base reacts to form a salt and water. Now neutralization, in this case that we're discussing now, if we have a strong acid and we have a strong base, then we also have neutralization. So if we have a strong acid, then we know something with the likes of a pH between 0 and 2, and if we have a strong base, then we know we're looking at a pH of 13, 14. So when a strong acid and a strong base, like any other acid and base, it will form a salt and water, but specifically here, the resulting solution will have a pH of more or less 7, a pH that is actually a neutral pH. When we look at our indicators, there's a choice of three indicators that we're going to use for the curriculum. If we have a strong acid and a strong base, and we expect that the salt will be more or less seven, then we must use an indicator that will show a color change in the range of more or less seven. So the best indicator to use whenever we do a strong acid and a strong base neutralization is bromothymol blue. Promethymol blue will change more or less round about a pH of 7. When we look at the neutralization between a weak acid, meaning an acid that's got a pH just lower than 7, and a strong base, meaning a base that's got a pH of, let's say, 13 or 14, when the two neutralize each other, it will also form a salt. But in this case, the salt that will form will have a pH that is a bit bigger than 7. And we then say, simply because it's bigger than 7, it simply means that we've got a weak basic salt. So the salt that's been formed by a, strong, by a weak acid and a strong base will actually form a weakly, weakly basic meaning it will have more OH- minus than hydronium ions in solution. In the case where we, where we use a weak acid and a strong base, the only indicator that we can use here is phenolphthalein. And we use phenolphthalein because we expect a color change around a weak basic pH. The last one that I would like to look at is where we have a strong, sorry, a strong acid with a weak base. Then if we have a strong acid, we have an acid with a pH of between maybe 0 and 2, and the weak base will have a pH just bigger than 7. When the two react and they form a salt, the resulting solution will have a pH that is smaller than 7. Now, a pH smaller than 7 is anything in your acidic range, but it means that the salt will be a weak acidic salt. For us to see the, the color change for this, for us to know that it will be a weak acidic salt, the color change should then be at a pH a bit lower than 7. And in the case of a strong acid and a weak base, we will use methyl orange to indicate the color change for us. And this, once again, brings us to the time that we all love. We're going to take a break now. I'll see you after the break. Mm -hmm.
Welcome back from the break. I hope you've enjoyed the break and I hope you are refreshed and alert for what's to follow. Before the break, we've been looking at titrations and we've been looking at a few of the terminology of titrations. We are going to go on now and look at protolytic reactions. Now, we spoke about protolytic reactions at an earlier stage. Protolytic comes from the word proton, and that basically means it's the transfer of proton from the acid to the base. So a protolytic reaction is the same as an acid-base reaction. Then we're also going to use the words conjugate acid, base pairs. So we will talk about a conjugate acid and a conjugate base, but let's lead on to that. Right, protolytic reactions, as I said, it's the same as acid-base reactions. And in an acid-base reaction, we've got a proton transfer from the acid to the base. Because according to the Laurie and Bronsted theory, we know that a proton is a, a, a that an acid is a proton donor and a base is a proton acceptor. So just to remind you again, this acid-base reaction is the same as talking about neutralization reaction. So when we look at hydrochloric acid, hydrochloric acid will then be the acid here. And because we're reacting it with water and hydrochloric acid is an acid, it simply means that water is our base here. So we also know, except for the fact that we know that hydrochloric acid is an acid and water is a base, we also know that hydrochloric is a strong acid, which means at equilibrium, the equilibrium will lie to the right. More products will be formed because hydrochloric acid is a strong acid. So in the forward reaction, we can see that hydrochloric acid will donate a proton to the base and the base will now take on the proton, which is now the hydronium ion concentration. So because hydrochloric acid um, transfer or give the proton, it's the acid, and because water accepts the proton, water is then the base. So in the reverse reaction, if we look at the reverse reaction, the, hydro, the hydronium ion will then, in the reverse reaction, give the proton to chlorine or to the chloride ion. So when hydronium ion donates the proton, it makes the hydronium ion an acid in the reverse reaction. And because chloride accepts the proton, it makes your chloride ion your base in your reverse reaction. Right, so when we have an acid and a base that forms an acid and a base, we talk about conjugate acid-base pairs. Now, a conjugate acid-base pair is normally the difference between an acid and its conjugate base is normally a proton difference. So between your acid and your conjugate base of that acid, there is a proton short because that acid has given away that proton to become the chloride ion, and that chloride ion is seen to be a conjugate base. When we look at water, and we know that because hydrochloric acid is the acid, that means that water is the base. So if you look at the base, the base accepts the proton, making it a hydronium ion, and that hydronium ion is now the conjugate acid to water. So in a conjugate acid base pair, the substances differ from each other by one hydrogen ion, or we call a hydrogen ion, we call it a proton. 
So if we look at this hydrogen chloride and water to form hydronium ion and chloride ions in our forward reaction, we know for the forward reaction, the hydrochloric acid is the acid, the water is the base, and when hydrochloric acid, as I said before, donated that hydrogen ion, it actually has one hydrogen ion less than before. So that becomes the conjugate base of the acid. If you now look at your reverse reaction and your chloride ion is now your base and your hydronium ion is now your acid for your reverse reaction, you need to see the following. If your hydronium ion is the acid, what do we know according to Laurie and Bronsted? An acid will donate a proton and a base will accept a proton. So if hydronium ion now donate the proton, it makes it, as we know, the acid, and the, hydro and the chloride ion will now be the base, and when it accepts that hydrogen ion, it becomes hydrogen chloride. So for both your forward and your reverse reaction, you should be able to see the difference of a proton between an acid and a conjugate base, or between a base and a conjugate acid. But back to the one on the board, we said that the second pair of conjugate acid base is the water is now the base in the forward reaction, and the water will now receive or accept a proton and becomes hydronium ion, and that hydronium ion in my forward reaction is the conjugate acid for water. But when it's the reverse reaction, that conjugate acid will now again transfer the proton to the chloride ion. Right, when we look at ammonium, NH3, if we um, mix or we react NH3 with water, we know that ammonium is a base. But we also know that water, in this case, because ammonium is the base, Water, in this case, will now become the acid. Now, in my forward reaction, once again, ammonium will then now, because it's a base, it will accept the proton. Okay? And the water, because water is the acid, water will now, in my forward reaction, donate the proton. So when water donates the proton in the forward reaction, it becomes OH minus, which is my hydroxide ions, meaning that if water was an acid, this is the conjugate base of the acid in the forward reaction. Sorry, the conjugate base of that acid. And what will happen now? The ammonium that will accept the, uh, the proton will now become the conjugate acid of the base. So our first pair there is water and hydroxide ions, and my second pair there is ammonium, which is the base, and it becomes the ammonium ion as the conjugate acid. Right, when we look at a strong acid, when we have a strong acid, the conjugate base of the acid, remember, differs by one proton. And that conjugate acid, the, the strong acid will form a weak conjugate base. So this base that form here is a weak conjugate base. But when we look at when we look at the water, which is in this case a weak base, this weak base here will form a strong conjugate acid. And the strong conjugate acid to the likes of hydronium ion is now a hydrogen ion or a proton difference from the water. 
So when we look at, ammonia, at hydrochloric acid, hydrochloric acid is a strong acid. A strong acid will always form a weak conjugate base. When we look at a weak acid, when we start with a weak acid to the likes of ethanoic acid or acetic acid, it will obviously form a strong conjugate base. So if you look at your vinegar or your ethanoic acid, ethanoic acid will be a, a, an acid. Your acid will react with a base. But what will happen here is when your acid transfers the proton to the base, it will become your acetate ion. And this acetate ion here will actually be, because this is a weak acid, the acetate ion becomes a strong conjugate base of the weak acid. The same with water. Water we know because water is an ampholite, we know that water is not a strong acid or a strong base because it all depends on the reaction as to how it will react. So your water will be a weak base and this weak base will now form hydronium ions and we know that hydronium ions will now be a strong conjugate acid for the weak base. So it's always the case that a strong acid will form a, a weak conjugate base and whenever something is weak, it will form a strong conjugate acid or base. When we look at the strong base, it will form, as we know, a weak conjugate base, sorry, weak conjugate acid. And if we look at sodium hydroxide, which is a strong base, if we have this strong base to react with an acid, then the strong base will now receive a hydrogen or a proton, hydrogen ion or a proton, making water my weak conjugate acid for this reaction, and my sodium chloride coming from hydrogen that's actually given away that my sodium chloride my water and my sodium hydroxide, strong base, weak conjugate acid. When we look at a weak base, it will form a strong conjugate acid, the NH3, H2, and then we will have ammonium, which is a strong conjugate acid, and we have OH-, which is a strong conjugate base. And this brings us to the wonderful part of the session. It's time for us to take a break. Go well, and I see you after the break. Welcome back from the break. I hope you are revived, refreshed, and that you're ready for more. We are going to go on with acids and bases. We looked at titrations in the previous session. I would like us to look at the hydrolysis of salts in the session to come. Right. When we look at hydrolysis of a salt, we will use the terminology hydrolysis, and during my explanation, you will understand what hydrolysis means. So hydrolysis is the reaction of a salt with water that may cause the change in pH of the solution. What you should remember is a salt is formed by having an acid reacted with a base in a neutralization reaction. It forms a salt, and if we take that salt and we now react that salt with water, if that salt and water have an alteration in the pH, or if the pH is changed, then we say that 
changing of the pH of the salt is actually hydrolysis of the salt. When we look at ammonium chloride, now ammonium chloride is a salt. And firstly, you must be able to tell us from which acid and which base does ammonium chloride come from. Now, if I write ammonium chloride, you can see clearly that it must come, the anion part of it is coming from the acid, and the cation part of my salt comes from the base. So you can clearly see that we had hydrochloric acid that reacted with ammonium in this acid-base reaction. So the hydrochloric acid transferred a proton to the base, and what will form here is the ammonium ion, or in this case, ammonium chloride, and we also know water was formed. So if you look at ammonium, uh, if you look at ammonia and, sorry, and the ammonium ion, the, you can see the difference between the two is an H plus difference. So obviously, ammonium is a weak base that will form a strong conjugate acid. The solution then, because of the strong acid and the weak base, the solution will then be strong I'm sorry, weak acidic. Right, so ammonium chloride dissolves in the water. Here we see the reaction. It forms hydronium ions and ammonia. And we know that the ammonium ion is a strong acid because it comes, it was the coming from a weak base. So your strong acid donates this proton to water. The proton is donated to the water. The water then becomes hydronium ions, and the ammonium ion is now ammonia. So more of your hydronium ions are formed, and we know that where we have more hydronium ions in solution, we know that it is acidic. So when we have more hydronium ions, it means that the pH will be less than 7. When we look at sodium carbonate, firstly, I always say if that is the child, who's the mom and the dad here? Now again, I said a little earlier that the anion or the negative ion of my salt comes from the acid and the positive ion or the cation comes from the base. So we can see that the base here must have sodium in and the acid here must have carbonate in. So we can see that the acid that was used was carbonic acid and the base that was used was sodium hydroxide. Now we know from strong acids and strong bases, weak acids, weak bases, we know that sodium hydroxide is a strong base, and we know that carbonic acid is a weak acid. So if we look at the carbonate ions here, carbonate ions is the conjugate base of the weak acid, meaning that the carbonate ions is actually a strong conjugate base because it comes from a weak acid. So being an acid, in the reverse reaction, it will actually now accept an hydro, um, a hydrogen ion, and when it accepts the hydrogen ion, it forms water, and the solution then is weak basic. How do we know it's weak basic? We have a strong base and a weak acid, so I normally think in terms of if this is my a neutral point, if I have a strong base, the strong base will be from that side and your weak acid will be more or less like that. So if this two starts to neutralize each other, it will form each other at a point that will be more or less weakly basic. When sodium carbonate dissolves in water, here's the carbonate ion, the carbonate ion will then receive a hydrogen 
ion, or we can say the water donates the proton, and we have hydrogen carbonate ion, and we have hydroxide ion that is formed there. So now we can see there's more hydroxide ions in solution, and we know more hydroxide ions in solution means that we have to do something to do with the base. So in this case, we have a base, and a base means that the pH is slightly more than 7. Why do I say it's slightly more than 7? Because the, weak, the base is a weak base that will form. When we look at sodium sulfate, with sodium sulfate, when that dissolves in water, the first thing that we will look at is if the child is sodium sulfate, who's the mom and the dad, then I would say the sulfate comes from the acid and the cation comes from the base. So here we can see that a base with the sodium in is a sodium hydroxide, and we know that it's a strong base. So we have the strong base sodium hydroxide, and an acid with a sulfate in is sulfuric acid. And we also know that sulfuric acid is a strong acid. So what we have in this case is we have a strong acid and a strong base that actually reacted with each other. So the salt was formed by a strong acid. The salt was formed by the strong base that reacted with the strong acid. So in both cases, we know that with a strong acid, sorry, with a strong acid, sulfuric acid, and a strong base, uh, sodium hydroxide, both of them will always completely, the acid will completely ionize, and the base will completely dissociate meaning that they are more comfortable in a ionic form. The equilibrium will always lie far to the right, more products than reactants. So in both cases, having a strong acid and a strong base, both of these molecules will always try to dissolve as much as possible to form the sodium ions and sulfate ions, as well as the OH, sorry, the sodium ions and the sulfate ions of your salt. Both of them will not dissolve in water. And if they don't dissolve in water, we say they do not hydrolyze, which means if they do not hydrolyze, they are coming from a salt that's neutral, and a neutral salt has got a pH of 7. Right, a salt formed by a reaction between an acid and a base, we know for a neutral salt with a pH of 7, the ions will not react with water, and we then say it will not hydrolyze, meaning it will not react with water, and the pH will therefore not be altered. So that only happens when we have a strong acid reacting with a strong base, that we have a salt that will have a pH of more or less 7. And that indication of that pH of more or less 7, if we would try to find out the pH, we will also see that we can then see from our two reactants, strong acid, strong base. Ions of a strong acid will form weak conjugate base, and it will not accept hydrogen ions, and it will therefore not hydrolyze. If I can think of the ions of hydrochloric acid will be hydrogen ion and chloride ions, they will much rather want to be in this format, so they are weak conjugate bases, and they will not accept this hydrochloric, uh, the chlo chloride ion will not accept the proton in the reverse reaction. Ions of a strong base, that is now sodium, and, hydro uh, and hydroxide ions will form weak conjugate acid, 
and it will not donate a proton. So it will not hydrolyze. It will stay in a ionic form and the pH will therefore not be altered. A salt formed by a reaction between an acid and a base for a weak acidic salt, meaning a salt that's got a pH of just smaller than 7, the ions from the acid will not hydrolyze because the ions will most probably be from sodium chloride, sulfuric acid, but the ions of the base will hydrolyze and that will alter our pH. If we look at a salt formed by a reaction that now forms a weak basic salt, meaning something with a pH of bigger than 7, the ions from the base will not hydrolyze, meaning we will have OH minus in solution. But the ions from the acid will hydrolyze, meaning that will alter our pH. And for that reason, a strong base and a weak acid will form a weak, a weak basic salt. And that brings us to that time again, where we will take a break and come back refreshed. Enjoy your break. Welcome back from the break. I'm glad that you're joining me again for the session. In our previous session, we looked at hydrolysis of salts, and this session we're going to use to explain in terms of a, an example. When we have sodium hydroxide and it's titrated against ethanoic acid, I just want to remind you that this ethanoic acid is the same as saying acetic acid. Okay, so we have sodium hydroxide and acetic acid, and they ask us to write down a balanced chemical equation for the titration of the reaction. Now, firstly, you must remember you need to know this, or you need to know your ionic table and to know how to write your formulae, and then you also need to know that what part of your acid will become your salt and what part of your base will become your salt, and then you will have to balance it because we've asked for a balanced chemical equation. We have the balanced chemical equation here where we have sodium hydroxide and ethanoic acid to form um, sodium ethanoate and water. Sodium ethanoate is my salt here and we can also call it sodium acetate. Okay, right, and then as it is now, the reaction is balanced. Now the question here is, which indicator will be used for this specific reaction? Now before you can make a choice on your indicator, you need to know what's reacting with what. So firstly, you need to know that sodium hydroxide is a strong base, and ethanoic acid is a weak acid. Now, when you just look at the two, you can see that the base being the stronger one, we know in genetics, we know that if we have a strong trait, the strong trait will always go and show, whereas your not so strong or your recessive trait will then be underlying. So, coming back to acids and bases here, if it's a strong base, then I can tell you now we will have a weak, a weak basic solution that will form here. So you will go look at your specific um, reactant that's strong, and you look at the characteristic of the weak one, and you combine the characteristic, the, the word strong, to the characteristic of the weak one, and you know that your reaction will be, in this case, this will be a weak basic salt. We can also look at it on the pH scale. If I have seven more or less there, 
strong base will be there and your weak asset will be just lower than uh, pH of 7. If these two start to neutralize each other, we will have a salt that will be a little bit over a pH of 7, which means a weak basic salt. When we go look at the weak basic salt, we know that a weak basic salt will have a pH in the range of, you know, a bit bigger than 7, so 8,3. So in this case, we will have a strong base and a weak acid reacting with each other in the presence of the indicator phenolphthalene. So which indicator would you select? We said that we will use phenolphthalein, but we always, we always need to answer why that specific indicator. When we go answer specifically what indicator, we need to say that the indicator comes from the fact that we were using a strong base and a weak acid. Right. Explain your choice of that indicator, as I said. So you need to talk about the fact that it's a strong base and a weak acid that's reacting. Right, so explain in terms of your reaction in front of you. You can now go look at if you have water that breaks up into hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions and you look at sodium acetate that breaks up into acetate ions and sodium ions, remember this is a weak acid, then you know that the acid of this strong base to the likes of sodium and the ions from the water to the likes of hydronium ion, uh, sorry, hydroxide ion, this two here will not leave the ionic state. They will try to remain ionic because it's strong base and there will be no stress on the water part of this reaction. But let's go on. When we look at the acetate ion and the, and the hydrogen ion or the proton there, these ions come from weak acid. And this weak acid here will always try to remain in molecule form and not in ionic form. So this hydrogen ion and the acetate ion will now react and it will shift the equilibrium to the left and it will form a molecule, which means that we will have a low Ka value there. So what's the stress on the equilibrium of the water? Uh, the stress of the equilibrium of the water will actually now, this hydrogen there, will actually combine there, which means that causes a stress on this equilibrium position. Right, but if we now go use our methodology to go look at what the stress is and what the response is, let's quickly go look. We now know if this hydrogen and the acetate ion reacts to form um, sodium acetate, it actually means that there will now be a decrease in the concentration of hydrogen ions. What will the system do? According to Le Chatelier, the system will try to respond to this by making more hydrogen ions to increase the hydrogen ion concentration. And if that happens, it means that my forward reaction will then be favored. And if the forward reaction is favored to make more hydrogen, it will also make more OH minuses in the solution. And that increase of my hydroxide ions will actually mean that I have a pH that's a bit bigger than 7. So your sodium ethanoate is a weak basic salt. Now we ask you to sketch a curve of the pH of the reaction solution where we will look now at the sodium hydroxide that's titrated against the ethanoic acid. Firstly, we need to know, we need to also go show the end point there. Um, so if we look at our axis here, we will have to say, in this case, we have the 
it's a novic acid in the butyrate, and we have the sodium, sorry, the sodium hydroxide is in the butyrate, and the ethanoic acid is in my flask. So over time, we will look at the pH, and we should know that we have a pH, not maybe there, maybe there, a pH more or less there for ethanoic acid, and we have a pH there for our um, hydroxide because it's a strong acid, and then this is more or less how our curve will look here. And if we go look at our endpoint, our endpoint should be midway of the point where we have a parallel line to the vertical axis, so we will have our endpoint more or less that, there. And what does that endpoint mean? That endpoint means that the salt that's resulting from a strong base and a weak acid is weakly acidic. Let's see. That is how it looks. We have an endpoint that's a weak, um, weakly basic. Sorry, I said weakly acidic, but it's weakly basic, meaning it's the pH is bigger than 7. Right. So if we summarize what we've dealt with today, we said that titrations are a chemical technique or method used to determine the equivalence point of a neutralization reaction. We also know that neutralization reaction is an acid and a base reacting with each other to form a salt and water. So salts may undergo hydrolysis and change the pH of a solution. I just need to remind you one way to easily remember this. I always say strong acid, strong base, neutralize, forms a, a pH of 7. Strong acid, weak base, neutralize, and because the acid is stronger, the trait of the acid will remain in the salt. So it's a weak salt. Strong base, weak acid, because the base is the strong trait here, it will form a weak basic solution. And that for me today, that is me, and this is where I will end our session today. I hope you've learned something, and I hope you will be able to use it. Please go well. See you next time.